Senator Jack Reed is looking to increase pay and housing funds for service members, but will it make it through Congress? Produced by Defense News and Military Times, this is the Early Bird Brief. Each morning we bring you the defense and national security news of the day. Also, the Navy is testing a new catapult system. What does this all mean for our defense and security? You'll find out. I'm your host, Simone Perez. Today is Tuesday, March 19th, 2024. First up, Senator Jack Reed is eyeing pay boosts and increased funds to fix military housing. But can he get it done? Capitol Hill Bureau Chief Leo Shane III joins us now. So, Leo, what is Senator Reed trying to do with regards to junior enlisted pay increases and military housing? Yeah, so uh, Senator uh, Jack Reed, who's the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, he came out in a uh, reporter's roundtable today and backed the idea of some targeted pay raises for junior enlisted troops, some more money for barracks, a whole bunch of uh, military quality life improvements. Now, this this is the rhetoric that we've heard out of House lawmakers for about the past year, a real focus on trying to find ways to get to those junior troops to help their families out, to better their financial situation. Situations. Um, there's been some talk of it over on the Senate side, but this is by far the most, most forceful comments we've heard from uh, from any of the members of the Armed Services Committee and from the most senior member of the Armed Services Committee. So this is a pretty strong signal that there is there's a, a unanimous voice on Capitol Hill now to get something if they can into the uh, into the appropriations bills, into the authorization bills for this year uh, to try and try and make some pretty significant changes to quality of life issues for uh, quality of life issues issues for for junior enlisted troops as early as next year. Yeah, but the real question, how likely is it that he will succeed? Yeah, there's the rub. Uh, You know, whether or not they're going to be able to do this is the problem. Um, Last year, when Congress negotiated with the White House uh, on on a budget deal and the debt limit deal, they included a a spending cap for this year's defense budget. So defense budget is supposed to increase only about 1%, though. And some of the things they're talking about are pretty significant um, cost increases. These targeted pay rates raises for junior enlisted troops, for example, would cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Some of the barracks improvements they've talked about might cost uh, several billion dollars. And that's money that's going to be tough to shoehorn into a a somewhat consolidated defense budget. So, you know, there's there's agreement that they want to do this, but how they're going to pay for it is the issue. So that's really what we're going to be watching over the next few months on Capitol Hill. Can they find ways to find cost savings or find ways to implement this over a few years um, to to put in these these improvements? which, you know, most lawmakers are saying are really needed to keep up with recruitment and retention issues that the military's had. It's not the kind of thing that you can say, we'll get around to it once the economy gets well. By then, you may be so far behind on your your personnel numbers that you're really having some trouble. So there's an urgency to move now. The question is whether or not they can make the numbers work to, to have that happen. Another important story, the four-class carrier is getting some new technology, including a new catapult system. For more on this, Navy Times reporter Diana Stancy joins the episode. So, Diana, could you explain the difference between the steam-powered catapult system and this new EMOLS catapult system? Yes. So the EMOL system, officially known as the Electromagnetic Aircraft Launch System, is, again, one of more than 20 new technologies installed aboard the Ford class of carrier. So basically, this system is what propels aircraft from the flight deck, and one of the biggest differences is that it significantly reduces manning needs in comparison to the steam-powered catapult systems aboard the Nimitz class of carriers. So um, unlike the Nimitz class steam catapult system, EMALS utilizes stored kinetic energy and solid state electrical power conversion to complete its mission. According to Naval Air Systems Command, what this does is it allows a high degree of computer control, monitoring, and automation. So this was one of the biggest uh, technology upgrades that the Ford class of carrier has gotten, and uh, the Ford carrier was the very first to deploy with this uh, earlier last year. And so what exactly are they testing with regards to this weapon? So right now, the future John F. Kennedy, which is the second of the Ford class carrier, is now conducting dead load testing. So that is where 
in Newport News Shipyard, they are hurling off large wheeled car like structures of graduated weights which are designed to emulate what an actual aircraft would be like if it took off from this particular flight deck. So they are literally hurling off what they're calling dead load testing um, into the James River, according to American shipbuilder HII. So this is designed to basically test out how they would propel aircraft from the flight deck in future simulations. Also on your radar for today, a follow-up from an investigation by Army Times reporter Davis Winky found that the Pentagon won't say if the tempo of troop deployments go above recommended goals. For more on this, Army Times senior reporter Davis Winky himself joins the episode. Davis, thank you for joining us. What did the Pentagon have to say about deployment tempos and if the Pentagon is outside its own recommendations? According to a policy that the Pentagon put out in the fall of 2021, but has since let expire, actually, uh, for every one month deployed, a service member is supposed to spend three months at home. And because Megan and I noticed during the course of my reporting for Broken Track that the policies enforcing these goal ratios of one to three and the dwell threshold of one to two, which is supposed to be the bare minimum, we decided to ask the Pentagon, hey, how often are you receiving and approving these waivers that allow service members to go overseas with less than the minimum required dwell, the response we got back was pretty disappointing, frankly. The Office of the Secretary of Defense told us those figures were classified. And that's a big shame because these events have a really big impact on a service member, on their families, and on really entire Army communities. The broken track investigation linked a high operational tempo with potentially a greater suicide risk for some service members. And the anecdotal evidence in support of family hardship and lower morale and lower retention and lower quality of life is is pretty strong when it comes to high op tempo communities. And what do experts say is detrimental about not following those guidelines for service members. The way that retired four-star general Robert Abe Abrams put it to me for a story that published earlier this month was that for the Army's armor community at least, the fact that they come home from a nine-month deployment and have only 18 months to prepare for the next nine-month deployment was, quote, crushing them. For certain communities whose training preparation requires them to spend a lot of time in the field away from home, uh, such as tankers, for example, because you got to have a lot of space to run your tanks and Bradleys around, the compressed, the, the compressed train up for the next deployment can mean that the less time you have to spend at home, the lower quality that time tends to be because there's just not enough time to fit in all of the requirements that you have to check before the next deployment. And now here's some other stories we're hearing chirps about. Pakistan's foreign ministry said the country's airstrikes early yesterday targeted multiple suspected hideouts of the Pakistani Taliban, including inside neighboring Afghanistan. The Afghan Taliban said the attacks killed at least eight people and prompted return fire from their forces. The Indian Navy said late Saturday that it took control of a bulk carrier hijacked by Somali pirates and evacuated the 17 crew members on the vessel. North Korea's neighbor said the country fired multiple short-range ballistic missiles towards its eastern waters yesterday morning. And Niger's junta said it was ending its years-long military cooperation with Washington. The U.S. military has hundreds of troops stationed at a major airbase in northern Niger in an effort to fight al-Qaeda and other Islamic militants. And on, and on this day in history, in 2003, the war in Iraq began. That's it for us this morning. To get more top stories and breaking news, go to defensenews.com EBB to subscribe to the Early Bird Brief newsletter. Please give us a like, rating, and a comment wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to follow us on social media at defense underscore news and at military times. 
The Early Bird Brief is hosted and produced by me, Zimone Z. Perez. Today's episode featured stories by Davis Winkie, Megan Myers, Leo Shane III, and Diana Stancy. Have a great day.